Okay, so uh, today uh, we're going to, to finish and to continue uh, the analysis of uh, uh, what we should do when we want to um, in integrate some uh, remote API calls uh, into our React application. Okay, uh, you may remember that last week uh, we developed this uh, very uh, um, important uh, web application when I write some text here like good morning uh, and uh, the we have a, a flipped version of this text appearing uh, here below and uh, every time I, I, I change this text every time I click on a letter uh, of course uh, I uh, generate um, an API call okay that will uh, pass as a parameter the text that I entered and uh, it receives uh, in the response body <coughs> a JSON containing the flip text. Okay, um, it it seems it looks like it's uh, practically uh, instantaneous. There is practically no delay no, uh, in in executing this code because uh, the um, API is basically very simple, and the API call on the back end. And at the same time, uh, the server is very, very close to me. Okay, I, I'm in the same uh, computer, in the same machine. But how to handle, for example, the case in which the server is slow? What would, that, would happen in that case? Hmm? So let's try to simulate a slow server and try to see how uh, we may uh, handle this case. Hmm? This is a very simple example, and we'll see how it, uh, how it affects uh, uh, more complex example. Hmm. So these are the code of our uh, flipper server here. Okay, where we let me make it just a, a little larger for you. Okay, and we have this uh, API flip that uh, uh, gets a, a text, uh, calls the flipped uh, library, and uh, immediately returns to the JSON. So assume, let's assume that we want to delay this. Uh, for, the, so for some reason, this computation takes some time. Uh, let's assume that uh, we are, um, some, the computation will take some time or the network connection is not so fast or whatever. So there, uh, this response uh, uh, doesn't come immediately. Um, for simulating that, maybe let's just set a timeout, okay? Let's say, okay, this uh, JSON response, uh, when I have it ready, but I will send it only later. So uh, this uh, rest.json will be inside a timeout, uh, let's say five, half a second, 500 milliseconds. Okay. So what happens if we do this? So let's save the server and see what happens in our client. Uh, I click on a letter, and after a while, uh, A, it appears, B, C, D, and so on. So we know that uh, um, the appearance of, of, the, of the result is a bit delayed, OK, for um, by our uh, server which is slow to respond okay um, how can we handle that uh, it's a bit uncomfortable okay because in a in a given moment we have some text and the flip text is different it doesn't match so because it's uh, uh, related to a previous version of the text okay so uh, how can we give uh, for example a feedback to the user that uh, uh, this text is still being computed so it's not updated immediately i know that you typed some letter and uh, please wait uh, before uh, this uh, other let's say information is updated okay uh, now 500 milliseconds may be may seem slow if you go to maybe 1500 you will notice that it's very uncomfortable when you type something then uh, when you're typing something, the, the system is typing something else uh, completely because it's related to the previous uh, um, half a se um, second and a half uh, uh, what you were typing before. So, okay, so at least we should tell the user, wait, uh, uh, 
the text that you see here is not yet the final version we are updating it we are waiting for the server to respond okay so how is that okay we, we could render i don't know an hourglass or a waiting icon or something like that or maybe gray out this text some visual indication that the update is still ongoing okay how can we handle that well an easy way to do that in the in the client of course because we cannot do anything on the server because it's a slow server we can do anything but at least we could do something inside our uh, front-end component okay um, by uh, adding to the to the return some visual uh, indication that some update is uh, still ongoing okay uh, I don't know maybe uh, some icon some some text uh, that will show me or some some style that will show me that something is still ongoing um, depending on the loading state uh, whether the application is still loading or not okay so we need to have an extra flag a status flag state flag we, we can we may call it uh, uh, loading and set loading uh, with uh, a state that uh, initially could be false at the initial uh, amount time of the component but whenever we uh, receive a change event on the input we know that it will trigger the effect and the effect will start the api which is low so at the beginning of the effect we may uh, immediately say um, okay now i'm starting to execute um, a fetch function so before doing that let's uh, um, set the loading state to true Okay, remember this is just a function definition the actual code of the of the effect are just this couple of instructions so before calling the api i set the loading state to true uh, what what can this affect okay maybe we can render maybe a conditionally a piece of, of code yearly for example if loading um, then uh, execute some uh, maybe waiting just a text something like that okay so when the user clicks on the or changes the text we are calling the callback and the callback here um, the set text will change the state this new state will trigger the effect because we have a dependency here and before issuing the the, the api call we are telling the user in a way that uh, uh, the current state is not is being recomputed okay and only after the the, the new value has been put into the, and the, the interface we can uh, delete this waiting messages again so after we set the new state the, of the new flip text we can say that okay we are no longer uh, we are no longer loading a, a new content okay so we are adding a flag a status flag that uh, is set whenever i'm uh, ready or i'm in the process of calling an api and is reset when this API is concluded. So after the response is received and processed and so on. And according to this flag, we may modify the user interface for telling the user, okay, the data that you are seeing is still provisional, is not final yet. Okay, so this works in this way with an error. Yes, because it, this should be a string. Or maybe let's put it into, into span it's better so we have a fragment uh, okay uh, 
okay so if i'm writing something hello uh, when i type a letter for a moment we have a waiting text and this waiting disappears as soon as the letter arrived back from the server okay and again if i delete a couple of them i wait and when the update arrives uh, we can uh, delete uh, the the hourglass or the icon or the different uh, say visual feedback that uh, the uh, the we are still waiting for a response okay so this is a common pattern in uh, in our applications um, where's the slide here okay we are adding on top of the uh, normal code that we had before uh, another state variable which is just handle just needed for handling the visual feedback uh, of the loading state uh, of your application mm. uh, so in this case we are adding something we may also disable something we may gray out something we may disable the buttons for example so the part of interface we are, should ask ourselves so which part of interface is still working or should be still working if we have incomplete data we are displaying incomplete data because we are still waiting from the for the complete data to come back from the server okay uh, if the user types a long string the waiting may disappear a few seconds before the end of the update yeah this is a problem uh, we hope we never have uh, such a slow server and the problem is that we are setting the waiting to false uh, when we are receiving the first response back from the client from the server Okay, so we have a long list of, uh, of callbacks uh, because it's just a, a Boolean value. So we are setting it through uh, once or many times, one every 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 text we type. And uh, um, the first time uh, a fetch returns, uh, we are setting it back to false. So if you have several pending uh, calls at the same time, uh, we should... Uh, um, Okay, the waiting disappears when the first letter comes back and not when the last one so we should that if, if we want to also handle this case we should have several flags say one per each call or a counter that remembers how many of them or another information that will tell us whether there are still pending um, fetches uh, to, to be completed um, we can uh, use a counter the counter just be, uh, be aware that is uh, uh, is dangerous uh, because uh, it may you may you may skip some some update uh, with the counter because use effect will uh, um, call the effect on the when the text changes okay uh, when the text changes after a render of the of the component uh, if you are very quick uh, in changing data, in, uh, a React may decide to skip a render of the component. So you may maybe increase or change the text, uh, but don't you don't render the component immediately. You render in the next cycle, and so you don't really uh, you are not really sure uh, that you are uh, calling the effect at every render. You may you maybe uh, skip one because uh, again it's uh, it checks uh, the change of the text. Uh, so there is no, let's say, um, listener that will immediately detect uh, the change of the text. We are not setting a sort of a listener, like we do maybe in Java and with our language, on this object. And whenever the object is, is changed, our function, our method is called. No, in this case, we are just, uh, uh, you remember how this parameter uh, works, uh, it compares the new value with the old value. Okay. So, um, but it compares that only when uh, the component has been rendered after in the life cycle after a re-render. Re so it may happen that uh, you have an extra call, uh, an extra increase or an extra decrease uh, for this reason. You, you, it can be solved, but the, we should be careful. Okay. So handling this kind of um, long delays uh, is is basically complex if you want to handle it right and uh, do all the use cases all the cases especially when you have more than one uh, variables to wait for okay uh, if the delay is low all these let's say little effects uh, are not uh, dangerous if, if the delay is very high 
um, then of course uh, you, you should have some some more logic before setting it to false okay uh, like for example <clears throat> remembering the different fetches that are still ongoing um, okay so this is a, uh, one, one uh, basic pattern another uh, uh, detail about uh, the um, uh, use effect that we didn't discuss uh, last time is uh, uh, what, um, let's say a different way of calling the uh, user effect. For now, user effect just contains the code for executing something, okay, some action, some side effect. Uh, the user effect function also has uh, a, a, an optional return value. So you may return a value from uh, user effect if you want. And if you return something, it must be a function. And this function uh, is used to clean up after uh, the component uh, life cycle okay so uh, we may remember that we have a picture early on about where is that about the life cycle of a component uh, where the component is mounted once and we know how to do some operation at mount time every effect is always run at mount time uh, one or more or many updates and use effect is called at every effect when the variables, the dependency variables change. And also we have the op options of, of um, calling a function when the component unmounts. So before the component disappears from the interface, you remember when we switch some routes, for example, or we have some conditional rendering, a component disappears, it's unmounted, and, you, and a new one will be mounted in its place. Um, so there is a, a strange way, let's say, uh, of deciding what to do when a component uh, unmounts before it goes away. And this is uh, returning a function from use effect. Okay, so you are setting up an effect that you, you know it will run at every render when the dependency is uh, changed, of course. Um, but you want, uh, before destroying the component, uh, to maybe erase some data structure, close some external connection maybe with the database or whatever if you have some resource that needs to be cleaned up before say deleting the the object you should put that into this function and uh, um, the idea is that uh, you have initially okay the first call of use effect uh, at the component mount time it always runs okay and uh, if you return the function the function is just stored away is remembered by React, and it's not called uh, right away. Of course, we just mounted the component. So the, uh, at the first time, the, uh, the function is not called. At every rendering, uh, basically, use effect uh, before calling uh, the actual uh, effect calls a cleanup uh, so that it may close the effect from the previous iteration and before so executing the call for the next one. And finally, uh, after the unmounting of the component, a final call of the cleanup function is made. Okay, uh, this intermediate calling is not always useful because again, it will be run just immediately before we run the next effect. So we may also avoid it if you want. But this uh, because you, we just have to put this information, this code inside the user effect with a with an if with a, with a with a flag that checks whether we are in the first time or not. And that would be. And another way of doing things but the the final call is something that can only be done in this way okay after the last render when the component is thrown away just uh, one second before you can uh, you can use that um, it only is mainly useful if you are setting up some external connection basically that you want to close uh, or you are because mm, you don't need to use that for you know uh, destroying arrays or list or, because they will be uh, garbage collected um, automatically okay so you don't need that for for destroying values uh, you need that just for as I say re uh, releasing the resources that you may have uh, uh, allocated during the, the mount of the component so yeah, it's a very special case so uh, all in all we have four different ways uh, uh, in which uh, the user effect can be called only once when the component mounts uh, we set an empty dependency list at every component render we just omit we don't specify any 
um, dependency list. So it's a big, there's a big difference between these two, of course. Um, or uh, at every uh, render, if some dependencies have changed, which is the normal form. Normally, we should use this format uh, uh, because it's the, it's the one okay, that works during the renders of the components. Hmm? Uh, render, always rendering is a special case, uh, uh, but it's maybe if this function depends on some values, uh, or we only want to run it when this when these values change. Otherwise, we are running it too many times. And finally, we can define the cleanup function um, to be called uh, at the end of the um, of the effect. In this case, in this example, we are defining a cleanup function for an effect which is only called once at the beginning, at mount time. So actually, we are executing this code exactly once at mount time, and that code, the cleanup code, exactly once at the unmount time, because there are no dependencies, and we have an empty dependency list, and so um, there's no intermediate calls during the rendering, the, uh, yes, the refresh of the component. So this part, the intermediate part never happens in this example and this is the normal case in which you, in which we are using that okay because having continuously clean up and rebuilding and so on it's something that just uh, doesn't have many use many useful uh, uh, use cases useful applications so in many cases when you are using the cleanup function we are doing that uh, only in the run once uh, let's say configuration hmm? um, of the of the effect so it's a, just a single effect, it's just a single hook, but it may use it in many different ways, and this makes it, uh, of course, complicated. There are, of course, other hooks uh, that are that will help us in handling the, the life cycle, for example. But uh, basically, we have the use memo and use callback, uh, which are uh, a way uh, of storing a value inside um, um, a component. If this value in the functional way is a so it just can be computed inside the component but we know that this computation is expensive we can use a sort of a, an effect that recomputes the value only when uh, some dependency change and so use memo does that okay it stores a result of a computation and instead of recomputing it at every function call uh, you it only recomputes it recomputes the value uh, whenever some dependency is called. So it's a special case of a use effect when the end result is not any side effect, but it's just updating some some local value. Hmm? So it's not it's just a, a performance uh, let's say optimization. It doesn't change the behavior of the system. Okay, so this is the basics. Hmm? These are the basics. Uh, we have the fetch. For interacting with the server, we have the effects for handling the the the, the external, let's say, data coming in and going out into our components. How do they, let's say, fit together, and what are their problems in some cases? Uh, we are. Uh, we just should remember that we have different types of state in our applications. And uh, we should handle this state in a different way, uh, depending on the on the nature of, of the state variables. Okay, um, some state uh, uh, is the real state of the application, so it contains the data, the real information on which the application is running. Plus, uh, we have some presentation state, uh, which is a set of extra variables that we need for handling the component. Okay. Uh, for example, in our flipping uh, example, uh, we have this uh, uh, flip text, uh, we have this loading flag and so on, uh, which are uh, the text itself. The text itself is needed for controlling the input element. The loading state is useful for uh, showing the say the waiting uh, say flag or something like that. So we have a lot of extra state which are only needed for the visual aspect or for the behavior for the local behavior of a component. It doesn't need to be passed around. It doesn't need to be remembered and so on. Okay. So in this case, it's not something that you want to remember or you want to store permanently on the database and so on. 
So in this case, you are just using a local state with a set state, and you are done. Okay, you don't need anything more. Uh, this state is only needed inside that component and its children, of course, and it's not needed outside the application, will not be needed tomorrow or whatever. Uh, in the other cases, uh, uh, our application should work uh, with a real global state, uh, the application state, uh, that is not uh, cannot be stored only in the inside the application. Okay, because we um, uh, when, when the application reloads, this state will be lost. Okay, so in this case, the application state uh, uh, should come from the backend, should also be stored into a backend, into the API, the API server. Okay, and so we have all the APIs for doing uh, all the create and read, update and delete operations uh, from uh, from the server. So the real, if we have our client and our server. The real state of the application, and they communicate, of course, with the fetches, the real state of the application is inside the database managed by the server. And the client, of course, has their own components and can display on screen some part of the state. And so uh, we have a problem because now we have two copies of the same information. One is the master copy the one on the server. The server is always right. It always holds uh, the truth. Okay. And inside the client, uh, we have some uh, transient copy. Okay. Last time I, I, I fetched the data from the server. These were the values. Okay. I'm displaying these values. Uh, whenever the server, the data changes on the on the master, of course, we should refre always refresh the client, uh, always to show fresh data, the latest data, in a way. Uh, and this data may change uh, for different reasons. Uh, one is maybe we are changing that. We are making a post, we are making a delete, uh, and so we are changing the data on the server. Or maybe other clients. Uh, uh, may be connecting to the same server, and so they are changing the data. So every time we are displaying some data, some application state in our client that comes from a server, the moment in which we are displaying that, it may be already old. So we should always think about mechanisms for uh, updating this state because uh, in the server it may, it may change. Okay. So uh, how do we handle that? Of course, we are uh, we are ending that with a with a use state again. Uh, we tend to push uh, this use state uh, up upwards in the hierarchy in the top level component or in some of the higher level components so that it can be shared by many components. And the updating of this state, let's say global application state. Uh, should be very, very careful because we should always try to keep in sync the local copy of the state with the master real um, information that we have on the server. So here we have some some examples uh, of use cases that uh, um, come out when we are trying to solve this problem, to handle this problem. Okay. Um, okay. The the first thing is uh, uh, let's try to be clean. Okay. To to organize some clean code. Uh, the idea is that, it, like we did here, it's very bad to mix some front-end code with some API or back-end code. So we are mixing here the management of the, of the state of the component that already has all its problems of asynchronicity and whatever with the, the uh, management of the, um, of the promises coming from the fetch uh, API. And so we are, in a way, uh, putting inside each of the components uh, the URLs uh, of the API server and so on. And it's very, say, from the point of view of the organization of the code, is very bad. Okay. So the suggestion here is uh, let's try to keep all the fetches into functions that we may put into a module. For, for example, we can make L, we may call this module API.js that will contains all the all functions for for calling the real APIs. So also the uh, know uh, the knowledge about uh, the URLs uh, it will be stored into that file. 
also all the error management because here really we are not managing any kind of errors so the response may be not okay or you you may um, have a, um, an exception here due to some server server error or format uh, error in the json and whatever so we here we should uh, handle the errors in some way but imagine adding the all the error handling code here in this component inside a user effect okay it will really make this component unreadable because then the, the same code will do a lot of different stuff so let's try to take these two lines okay and isolate them into a separate file so in that way it will be easier to maintain and also will be easier to swap the real apis uh, with the stub mechanisms so you, you may have two versions of the api.js file one that really does the call on the server and the other that just returns uh, fake data or stupid data or local data for testing or for debugging purposes and so whenever maybe you don't have the you don't want to run the server it's not running or uh, you have to pay for it or whatever okay uh, so in in this way the front end doesn't know um, whether it's calling the real server or not because it's just calling some front end function that we define there uh, and we are removing some dependencies so all the uh, user interface code every react component never knows about uh, which is the uh, the api server which is the, its uh, web address or whatever okay and also the api code may only may focus just on uh, making network connection and doesn't need to know when or why its methods are being called okay it's the same pattern that we used on the server when we separated the the, the express routes from the DAO object, the DAO class that will uh, contain all the database interface methods with all the nitty gritty details about those. And the same thing on the front end, we separate the low level code. So basically our mm, complete architecture would be something like this. Uh, the user interacts with the DOM, of course, okay, this is the job of the, the browser. We don't need to care about that. We need to care about our components that of course are mounted on the DOM and uh, we try to manage uh, as best as we can uh, use states, uh, event effect, effect, use effect, uh, side effects and uh, event handlers. Plus of course the renders, uh, this, the easy part. Returning the renders uh, is the easy part uh, of the component, <laughs> I like we uh, understand. So this is our uh, job, whenever we um, need to have some data from the server we call a function into api api or whatever you want to call this file is the only one that can issue fetch command so we never we decide okay for our own safety or earth uh, not to call any fetch outside of some controlled files okay and these files don't know anything about react basically okay so react uh, basically ends here from this point down, uh, we are just uh, HTTP hmm? uh, to, to handle we, with fetches, with the error messages, and so on, and JSON data, and whatever. You may have uh, some objects, uh, uh, JavaScript objects that we, are, we want to transfer back and forth, but there's no knowledge about uh, about React here. Okay, there's just simple fun utility functions. On the server side, on the server side, we are receiving these HTTP calls with JSON payload. They are handled by Express, so again, it's not our job, it's Express that is doing that. We are writing the routes, of course, to handle them. Uh, from the route, we extract uh, some information, and this information will be given to another function, this DAO, that uh, uh, ultimately will uh, uh, interact with, data, with the real database. Okay, so whenever the user types uh, A somewhere, we go all this way through all these layers until this A is stored into the database uh, uh, in some field uh, somewhere there, okay? Um, we, are try, we try to maintain all this separation of, the, of different layers, so that at every layer, layer we can focus uh, on a different problem, okay? Uh, of course, in, some, in the example that we see in the slides, uh, we are not making this distinction to avoid pages and pages of text, and so you will see still, we will still see in the slides uh, the um, fetch being called directly from inside the component uh, without this intermediate layer 
but in the real in the exercises we'll try to to, to stick with this model <coughs> there is a question which is not an easy one to answer basically nobody in the world has a definite answer for that is uh, who is going to call the apis that in turn they will call the facts of course okay uh, do we need to call the apis uh, from use effect or from event tenders and in which case uh, we should call them from the event tenders and in which cases uh, we should call them from use effect we'll try to analyze this problem with the next examples okay uh, if we stand by let's say that the theory that we got you we described you last last week uh, the theory would be that every call to fetch is a side effect and so it should be contained inside the use effect because it cannot be part of the pure um, functionality the pure say functional code of the of the component but also an event handler is a callback that is executed outside the uh, the, rend the pure functional render code it's it's already basically an uh, side effect every time we we write uh, event dot target we are accessing something which is outside the component even just for reading its value. So we are already doing some side effects inside event handlers. So we always have the question whether we need to call this fetch, to call this API from the, the directly from the event handler or indirectly from a user effect that will be triggered by the, um, by the user action, by the new data that is changed by the user, okay? Uh, there is not an easy answer to this question depends on the cases so we are trying to see some some cases uh, and try to discuss some benefits or, or 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 issues or warnings in some of the cases and then uh, in every case we should try to to balance okay the, the different choices and there is no there is no right way there are better ways hmm? um okay Coming back to the problem of having two separate states, one on the client and the other on the server, uh, React introduces some strange words. Uh, if we want, uh, say, uh, to, uh, to ensure that the real state is always on the server, so remember, the server, the server has the truth. The only real truth is on the database in the server. Every time we need to, uh, we say, open an application, we should retrieve the state from the server okay the application starts by knowing nothing and it starts getting information fetch information from the server and this operation is called rehydrating okay so if you have something in a uh, in a state uh, in a minimized state uh, which doesn't have any any water in it and you want to pour water in it so that it can inflate and return back to the original uh, form okay they are, they are using this uh, this this, strange, this chemical word basically um, by rate rating we mean reconstructing the local application state in the client from the data coming from the server and this operation should always be done at the mount of a component maybe for the global state for the main state we are doing that when we are, when we are mounting the upper component, the top level component, or maybe also some intermediate component. When the component needs some state, it will ask for the server to have a, some JSON representation of this information, and it uses that for, for filling its own local state, which is always a copy of the server. This, of course, we is mandatory to be executed at the mount time of the component, because otherwise the component doesn't have any data, cannot do anything. And whenever we want to refresh the state, uh, whenever we have uh, some, maybe uh, we, th we think or we know that the state on the server is different from the state uh, on the client. And so at that point, uh, we just repeat this effect. Uh, and so the data will be called again and will be, uh, we are going to repopulate uh, uh, and refresh the local information. And then, of course, if the data didn't change, uh, then React is clever enough not to change anything in the front end. But if the data changes, okay, we can see some new items or some less items in our list, in our, uh, in our client state, okay? Uh, 
and of course we may also change the state so when you are doing some add operation where you are doing some delete operation so we have an add button we have a delete button or whatever and uh, we are changing the state so if the rule is that the, the real state uh, is on the server the add action the event handler for an add should immediately first of all change the state on the server not the local state the local state is not important it can be thrown away and rewritten every time we want okay it's just a local copy if we want to really add an item we add it on the server and in the moment in, we are, in which we are adding it on the server of course our local state is no longer updated and so we need to refetch all the state or just a, let's say an incremental version of the state from the server so when we are adding something when we are deleting something where we are changing some data we should always update it on the server and on the client okay uh, be sure that we are updated in both uh, in both um, places and the important part is the update on the server okay so uh, some code okay the hydrating at mount time uh, is nothing special basically uh, we just have a user factor that will uh, um, be used at mount time so we are executing it only once if we need that this data is not going to change for example and uh, we are uh, fetching data from the server and setting uh, this list of items into our application storing that into our state so basically this is a this first state list is a local copy of the application state hmm? and that we fetch from the server and then the component can do whatever it wants with this list uh, if we want uh, if the we think that the initial call could be slow and to be able to show something uh, at the first render uh, we may also use the loading trick uh, as we had before uh, so we may add some uh, uh, maybe some delay some hourglass uh, uh, icon in addition or uh, in uh, or, or replacing the real data hmm? so this should be just uh, uh, we are adding an icon saying okay we are still loading or this could be just a, um, as a, a conditional so if we are loading the render this otherwise render uh, um, the, the real component so in, in a way we are waiting to render the children until the data arrived so in a way we are landing on a page in this page we are just have a spinner a waiting indication and uh, then in the in background data uh, starts uh, to be loading and uh, when data arrives uh, we are replacing we are removing say the the weight indicator and uh, we are showing the real components that now already have the data to to display themselves okay so this is the the normal pattern of, of the components then of course we have a choice whether every component should load the state that it needs or we load everything on the top at the beginning and we pass it down with properties again it's a design choices there are no real uh, uh, right or wrong answers with that okay uh, of course we try we should try to avoid reloading the same data many times but um, and uh, uh, every time we are doing that uh, we are we know that since we are loading the initial state at the beginning of the at the mount time of the component uh, uh, that state uh, may change on the server without the client knowing that the client doesn't know that Okay, and uh, uh, so we, if we want to update it in some way, you can just add some dependencies to your user effect. Sorry, wrong slide. Uh, you can add some dependencies so that this very, this very same effect. So if you add some dependencies here, we run more than once. And so you can control when it runs. In some way, it can, you can control when the data is refreshed because we are doing an initial uh loading but then every time we load it we are refreshing the data we're refreshing you with a new copy of this data according to some condition that we can control using the dependencies array here uh, 
uh, we may have different strategies for how and when uh, we want to refresh the data. It may seem a bit uh, expensive because in this case, we, at every time, every little change, maybe we are reloading the full list instead of just reloading some differences, some deltas. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, if the data is very large, uh, it doesn't make sense to reload all of it every time, and sh we should so do some extra work uh, for just, uh, um, say, um, getting the la latest changes uh, from the differences from the version that we already have. But this will be, again, a very complex uh, uh, thing to implement. So for the moment, we are just assuming that we can afford reloading a fresh copy of the data whenever we need it. Okay. Uh, there are some problems with this approach. Okay, this is the right approach, of course. Uh, we load the data at the beginning and we refresh it when we need it, when we are suspicion that, that, that something may have changed. There may be, uh, there may have, uh, we may have some implementation problems, basically. One, okay, it's not really a problem, is the way the web works, uh, uh, in which we have one uh, client uh, and we may have many servers uh, that are, uh, sorry, we have one server and we may have uh, many clients uh, uh, accessing that server. And so the state is only here, the A variable is stored only here, but it's uh, visible uh, by many browsers. So whenever uh, this browser maybe is adding uh, a new course, a new exam, so we are in the add mode here, in the add route, when you click on save, this browser will uh, add a new line into this uh, database here. But all the other browsers don't know it in the moment it happens. So how can, okay, we added one line and the refresh of this information will show the new exam. So I will see five exams, one, two, three, four, five. But here we, I still see four of them. Here, here we still see four of them. And basically, this browser uh, may be, it hasn't been refreshed in a while, and I only see three of them. Okay? Because the web is a client server uh, architecture, so unless the client asks for new data, the server doesn't care. The server has no way even to tell the browser that, okay, the data that you have is old, you should get a new copy. Okay? So, uh, how can I know that somebody else changed some data in the server? Okay, uh, basically, how can uh, how can I know it can't? Okay, it can't uh, using the protocols that we know. Huh? Uh, so it's this is a, a, a very complex problem. It's a distributed computing problem, basically, to uh, synchronize. Uh, a state that can be mutated by different clients. So it's one of the classical problems that uh, really have no, 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 no solution, no simple solution for sure. Uh, so, but we don't need to, to solve the problem in general, okay? Uh, we may have some simple solution that tries to mitigate the problem. Mitigating a problem means refreshing frequently. Okay, so whenever something happens or with some rule we just ask to the server please give me a fresh copy of the data and then i update my component if nothing changed okay it's not a big issue i just made an, one extra api call if something changed of course my components uh, um, will uh, will ad update spontaneously uh, very easily so we must just decide when we want to refresh it so there are some moments in which we know for sure that we need to refresh. For example, if I'm adding something, I'm sure that something changed because I am the one changing that. So since I just changed that, I can, I'm can. i sure that I need to refresh on the server. And by the way, if I'm refreshing on the server, I may also get, okay, for free, some other changes coming from other clients, from other users, okay? So whenever I do a modification, add, update, or remove of any items, I should always refresh with the server. So every modification should imply two operations. One, do the modification on the server, and second, get a fresh copy of the data. 
both of them at every time okay uh, but if the user is just looking at the code there is not modifying anything okay we could add a refresh uh, maybe in the routes so when we can we change the route with the router so we open and close the component every time a new component is rendered of course uh, it, it, it needs to reconstruct the state so in the in the in the when you are designing the routing of the component you or every component uh, before rendering should load a copy of the state so instead of putting the state in the up, in the upper component you put it into the routes component and so every time you change page in a way um, you need to refresh the state at every click the, the application would be slower okay because before changing to the page it needs to wait for the server for the data but it will be slower but fresher in a, in a way or uh, you may also have some polling mechanism so you set a timer and every five seconds, every two minutes, every 20 milliseconds, no, don't do that, please. Uh, you ask a new, for a new copy and you update the state. And this is going on in parallel with other activities. By the way, these mechanisms are not uh, um, mutually exclusive. You may have this one, which you should always have, maybe plus some polling or some uh, uh, refresh when the application switches context or something like that we are not solving the problem okay because it may also be we it will also be possible or will also have always happen that when a client changes some information the other clients don't know it immediately and so there's also some risk of having two different clients that's trying to modify the same data at the same time we are not going to solve this problem in this course okay because uh, uh, it, it's more of, of a server-side uh, problem where uh, you have to keep the synchronization of different copies of the data. You have to ensure that if you have conflicting modifications, uh, um, you end up with a, in a consistent state. Okay. Um, for example, if I'm trying to add uh, one exam and, and the other client is trying to delete uh, the same exam if the deletions come before then you can add a new one if the deletion comes after you cannot add a second copy of the first one so um, the, the final behavior of the of the application depends on the order in which uh, information hap uh, operations happen and these operations also depend on the on this application state on the client that may allow some users to do some actions or not depending on some information which is uh, uh, not very um, not reliable at all not totally reliable but it's the same when you are doing some video game and shooting each other and you shoot uh, an enemy here and the enemy in the which is maybe working from uh, playing from another location already moved so you see your bullet uh, going straight to the enemy but it does, it's not killing him because you already moved in some other places o only your computer didn't know that the the other uh, player has moved uh, and so you have, have this lagging effect that creates, uh, uh, makes real-time games very, very difficult to implement, you know, because you, you need uh, to have a real uh, fast updates and low latencies. Okay, we have the same problems here in web applications. In this course, we are not, uh, uh, we don't have the resources, the time, okay, for, for finding a real solution. But we can try to mitigate it, to minimize the effect of this problem. The real solution could be, should be, uh, giving a mechanism for the server to push some information to the client because the server knows when its data has been changed but when, once the server knows it, it doesn't have any means any ways any mechanism for telling all the clients uh, hey there uh, take this new copy of the data because i changed something because uh, HTTP doesn't allow server started uh, connections, the connections always start from the client. Okay, so the solutions, of course, in real application we have solutions, but they are usually based on other mechanisms. For for example, web sockets are one. Web sockets is a, a permanent connection, bidirectional one between a browser and a server, where either of the two, the browser and the server, can send packets of data on this connection 
but it's not working on the HTTP protocol. It's a, a separate protocol that is implemented by the browser, of course, is WSS protocol. Um, it's not complex to implement, but it's a, another architecture altogether. Okay. Um, so all the yes, all the applications uh, you mentioned Slack, uh, Dropbox, or whatever, every chat application usually also have one uh, say client-server component of the application plus one or more challenge channels for getting uh, say fast updates. Uh, which is not, uh, if you open a, say, a network monitor right, right now, when you are some applications open, you see that you see that uh, there are some other connections open. Uh, if, the, if the client is in the browser, you may use some, say, technologies that are compatible with the browser. Otherwise, you can just go down with some other, uh, say, application like you know, Zoom or whatever, just use uh, TCP IP connections. Uh, the old style sockets and the send data whenever they need that. But in web applications, we have some higher level solutions. Um, web applications do too should should be able to ad address some part of these problems. There's also the distributed um, systems course um, by Professor Sister, which is also trying to um, study the problem from let's say the let's call it theoretical point of view. So. Uh, what are the mechanisms that guarantee that they don't lose data? And this uh, is, a, is a theoretical problem that may, of course, affect the way in which you are implementing that. So uh, this is just to say, uh, we don't expect to solve this problem in this course. Uh, and if you try to solve it by hand, uh, you will never finish. Okay? Uh, we try to add something like the example before. We have a Boolean value, and then we saw that the Boolean value is not enough. Maybe we need to to have a second boolean or an array of booleans for the delay or um, or a counter and we see that every solution we find still has some problems just because the problem cannot be solved in a client server way only you need more powerful methods more powerful distributed computing uh, patterns and uh, so we can try to make it better but we are sure that there will always be cases in which we are losing some updates or we are or you are rendering some old data so for sure um, but of course we try we try to focus on creating at least the front end and then leave for for the future the solution of this problem uh, many many applications don't need to be very um, uh, you know, if you go the, to the to the real exams uh, of the Polytechnico, if I change your exam, of course, until you refresh the page, you don't see the new data, and nobody gets killed for that. So, okay, <laughs> uh, it's it's normal. Okay, in many cases, uh, we don't feel it as a as a big problem. Only in collaborative real-time applications, of course, these problems uh, need to, need to be tackled in some way. Otherwise, we just live with the fact. That we live with the fact, with the real with the first assumption, that there is only one source of truth, and this is the server. If we know that, we can always refresh, and uh, uh, any damage we, that, we did on the client, uh, you hit on refresh, and you start from zero, from the only one that really knows the, 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 uh, the truth. Um, in user effect, we also have some problems. Okay, we are using user effects to uh, refresh the data, refresh the state. We should also be, be aware of some problems uh, in, uh, in user case, in user effect that could create uh, um, infinite loops, basically. So it was, uh, it's worth the time to, to say analyze a couple of cases so that we can avoid that those in, in our code. Okay, uh, what we are doing is a uh, user effect that is triggered by some state modification. Okay, so we have a dependency array with a state. And then inside the code, we are, so, we are also changing some state. So we are doing some set state or whatever. So it may happen that the state modification triggers the effect and the execution of the effect will change the state that will in turn trigger the effect that will in turn change state that will and so on and we are stuck with an infinite loop okay 
of course, this is a very visible case. Okay, when when we are maybe inside an effect, uh, we are using a set state, uh, for example, for incrementing uh, a variable, uh, c c plus one uh, set state uh, set uh, sorry c c plus one. And uh, uh, and the the effect depends uh, on c, on the state variable c. Mm -hmm. um, and in, the, in this case, it's obvious that we are uh, looking for trouble. Okay, um, but there are some cases in which the same happens uh, without being uh, so obvious. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, have a look at these uh, two examples. So we have some. Um, effect that uses a count variable and it increments this variable there is no dependency on c so we are not creating an infinite loop where i'm uh, uh, updating c i'm triggering its update and so on okay by the way the value of the, or the value of the count of course is displayed here in the render so the idea is that uh, we have the um, control component, so an input uh, with the change event here that is just updating the state uh, variable value. So value, value, and the unchange that just updates the value. It's very classical input text. And then we want to count how many times uh, the data has been modified by the user. So at every render, every time we render this component, that's why we don't have uh, uh, the second argument. We want to, at every render, we just increase the discount. And so we are, oh, I'm expecting to see a, an input uh, with a zero. And then when the user types something, A, this becomes a one, A, B becomes a two, and so on. Okay? This is the intention of this component. But we have a, an error here. Can you spot the error? OK, so the idea is whenever the user changes something, we increase the counter once, and we display it. Anybody wants to win? Yeah, the, what happens here is that uh, the modification of C of C itself uh, creates modifies a state variable, yes, and creates uh, a new render of the component itself. So when I click A, of course, C goes to 1. But since, because C went to 1, then the component is refreshed again. And since I have no dependency array here, uh, C went, uh, goes through, and then 3, and then 4. This is run, this effect is run not only on the modification of value, but also on the, of, on the modification of C. So the modification of C may trigger that. So the, uh, the idea is just to avoid this problem, we should always be sure that uh, we are running the effect only when value change and not when the state changes, when the C, uh, C changes. OK, so we need to be explicit on the dependency list. This may look uh, strange because we have a dependency on a value that we don't use here. We don't need the, the value inside the component. So why are we depending on that value? We don't care about that. Uh, we are depending on, basically, we are not depending on that value. Uh, we are just saying that we don't want to depend on count. OK, if we, you forget the second parameter, the default will be to depend on all, everything, on the props, on count, on value, and on count. 
because at every new render, uh, some of these may have changed. So if we are just listing values, it means that we don't want to depend on count, on the count state. Okay, so uh, we already have the rule that uh, every variable which is used inside user effect must be listed as dependency, otherwise we could uh, lose some, uh, some updates. Now we are complementing these rules, the same, okay, but uh, also try to add some variables that decide when the effect should be run in a way, okay? By the way, uh, sorry, uh, just be aware that in this, in this example, these effect, uh, what are the variables uh, the state variables or the properties that this user effect is, is, is uh, using is really depending on. Okay, so remember last time we already said in the dependency list you should always have all the variables uh, that are used inside the function. And it seems, uh, okay, our intuition says, okay, but, but we are, we, this is the count. So shouldn't we depend on count also because we are using it inside here? Uh, the answer is no. Because here we are not depending on count as an object here, because this C will be a copy of the count that will be generated later. Okay, we are uh, we we decided to uh, update the state in a callback. Okay, so the actual variable count is not used here inside the effect. Um, and uh, that's. And this is also wrong in the code because it's not it's not the correct syntax. It should be set count C R O C plus one. So this part here, sorry, is uh, should be here C R O C plus one. And this we don't have any we don't need any any parameter here. Sorry for the mistake. Uh, there are two nested callbacks uh, and we got it wrong on the slides. Okay, so this is a problem, uh, the first problem. Always try to think at least twice uh, about what to include and what to exclude from the dependency list. Okay, we have another quiz, another potential problem, which is, this is more difficult to spot. So what are we trying to do here? We have again an input value where we are entering some secret value. Okay, and uh, we have a non-change that basically updates the state. Okay, this is a very complex syntax. Why are we using this complex syntax? Because the state, the secret state variable, is in fact an object, and this object has two properties, value and count. Okay? So we are uh, on, on change, we only need to update the value. So with this syntax, we are just saying, okay, leave the other attributes uh, along, don't change them and only change the value to the event of the target of value. So in a way, we are uh, controlling this input with only one component of the state variable. Okay, nothing, nothing wrong here, okay? And then uh, we have an effect that will count every time, not every change, but every time the secret value is a secret. So if the user enters the right password, the right secret string, then um, it will be, uh, you, you can increase this count. So you are updating, we are updating the other component of the state. So instead of having two state variables, two separate state variables, we, let's say, collapse all this information into one object. And we update uh, each, uh, say, property of this object separately in different moments. Okay. Of course, uh, we have since we are uh, updating S, which is the secret state, we uh, the state variable. We need to depend on this state variable, right? Because the uh, value, when we change the value we need to run this effect. Is there, are there any problems with this code?
the idea is the same as before because we are updating some object some value inside an effect from which we are depending uh, is more hidden because we are uh, let's say only updating some components we should always remember and uh, the, call, the callback syntax uh, allows us to remember it that we are not really modifying uh, one variable here but we are recreating a new object there so every time we do a set secret uh, here or there we are creating a new object uh, with some attributes uh, with, that we are copying from the old ones okay so again here we have again an infinite loop uh, and this as, uh, as before because uh, the object has changed we are creating a new object okay when the value changes uh, we are creating new object and the creating new object will trigger again this dependency because uh, it's uh, from um, if from the the full object the full site object okay so this means that uh, if we want uh, uh, to avoid this problem so when a component of the state changes which is not a component that i'm depending on uh, the solution is uh, for example to only use uh, the value as a dependency and not the old or not all, not all the state hmm? uh, the idea is that whenever you have an object uh, don't use a, a complex object in a dependency, uh, in a dependency array. Try always to use uh, individual values, single values, numbers, or whatever. Um, so even if you are storing, user, uh, people tend not to use objects in use state, so they, they prefer also for the reason to make probably two, two different states uh, and update each of them separately it's also easier maybe you have mm, you end up with having uh, 12 different state variables but at least they are easier to to handle uh, when we have objects uh, it's become more more um, more complex uh, because we cannot update a single component of the object we can only only update the full object and this will trigger the dependency even of some components the good point is that this effect is, is clever enough uh, to understand the dependency not just directly from an object but also from some of its components. So this will work as before, work well as before. Okay. Uh, so let's just remember the rule: uh, don't use objects uh, as dependencies. Only to use uh, single values mm, or single properties of the objects. Sec but this also works in the same way for so for, for objects uh, you you could tell me okay you, you it's an issue that you created yourself so we, we would never do something so complicated for updating one component of the state uh, the problem is that this also happens uh, even if it's more difficult to see to understand uh, it also happens with lists so imagine our list of exams uh, or list of courses or whatever you have an array that contains a list of items and you want to do something maybe when a new element is added or deleted or modified or whatever okay and so uh, you, you you would uh, depend for example on, uh, uh, on on an array this tends to create uh, um, infinite loops uh, even if uh, the data doesn't change so what are we trying to do here for example we are fetching a list of items uh, at the beginning at mount time right and we are setting the list uh, with these items that we load what's wrong uh, in uh, using the list uh, as a dependency here well in this case we would if i had this dependency written here what uh, i would have is uh, a first run of the effect at the mount of the component mount the component mounts then sets the list variable with the list of items okay this will change the state and with the new state of course we are retriggering again the effect we are triggering the effect that is uh, we are refreshing basically this list 
uh, and uh, we'll uh, do a second fetch that will return, and this is the key point, return the same data. So you could imagine we stop the problem, we read some number, we don't have any data, okay, we read some data, five, number five, okay, we set it to the state, the state change triggers the new effect, we call the effect, we get the, new, the same value five. And what React does, what the user effect does, is compare the old five with the new five and says they are equal, so uh, we don't need to run the effect. We only run it once more, not infinitely more. Okay? This works with uh, simple values. With array, the type of comparison that uh, uh, React does is just the comparison of the object values. So it doesn't go into comparing the elements of the array. So basically, at the first uh, uh, rung, you may have the array 1, 2, 3 at the first fetch. When you run the effect a second time, you will have an array of 1, 2, 3. And these will be treated as different by React. Because it's a new object, and it's up here. It's a different object. It React doesn't go inside the objects to check the equality of the components. So in this case, we are creating an infinite loop even if the data doesn't change. And this is more dangerous because, as I said, it's more difficult to see in this case. Okay. So again, the rule would be let's avoid complex data as dependencies. So if in this case, we just need the data once, we, okay, it's easy, we can only call the effect at mount time with an empty array or whatever. Or if we really need to refresh this data more than once, depending on the, on the value of the list, for example, so we are modifying something locally and we want to refresh from the server. It's a normal use case. Uh, so let's not depend on the list, but create another state, a flag, a Boolean variable. I modified, yes. And so, like the loading uh, that we had before, I modify something, and so I, I have an extra flag in our st in my state uh, that is used to trigger the effect. Uh, just to avoid depending on the data itself, which is a, say a complex uh, object that is considered as different, even if uh, it contains the same value. Or in some cases, you can also depend on some. Uh, uh, individual items in the array so if you have list uh, zero for example it would work uh, but of course it would be just a special case or in some cases you may use some property maybe the length of the array so if the only modifications that you are considering are adding or deleting an element this modification will change the length and this is just a number that is compared correctly so this length will be three and the other length will be three and so I stop the execution of the, um, of the effect. So always try to put a simple value, a simple string, a simple boolean, or a simple number into the dependency array. If you are storing an object or a list, there's always the risk that you are, say, triggering an infinite loop without, uh, without knowing that, without considering that, because the data is the same. Yes, the data is the same, but the object, the container is different. Okay. With objects, uh, like before, you need to be more explicit. You need to do more work, and so probably you will think it uh, uh, more more likely. Okay, or, or what you what you are doing, uh, updating a single component of a state. With arrays, it's much easier to to be mistaken. Of course, with an example of five lines, it's easy to spot the error. The problem is when the component uh, gets bigger and you have a lot of variables uh, that depend on each other. And um, we should try to avoid that. So basically, we understand the mechanism, but we can we come out of this of it uh, with just one sing, single rule: don't depend on objects or arrays, uh, which are a type of objects, only on simple values. Um, okay. And this is just for what we discussed uh, up to now. Was just for um, loading data loading data at the beginning or refreshing data after a while. And if we want to modify data, 
so we are trying to uh, we need to do just the, the opposite operation not just uh, rehydrating so loading from the server but also dehydrating storing on the server we know how to do that okay we have a callback an add item on our button and this uh, add item calls uh, a callback that uh, needs to do needs to update uh, the the remote state with a post call okay this is incomplete we need to do the json or everything okay but it's not a com the complete syntax but the idea is that uh, uh, when we click on add we need to update the server so that the server will include this new uh, with new element uh, that we just uh, inserted into the, in the component and we may also update the local state the list of items okay uh, because uh, locally we are showing some items the state has already been loaded into our application we add one more and so why not showing it here so we are adding it to the local list and to the server database okay this works by say doing an incremental change both on the server and on the client copy of the data that we got from the server uh, this is, a, is in a way is uh, optimistic because it assumes uh, two conditions one that the server data didn't change by other users in the meantime and the second is that the post is successful it doesn't have any problem with networks or or conflicts i duplicate ids or whatever so uh, this is a sort of a optimistic choice no like lorenzo is saying uh, uh, we to be to be safer we should re reload from the server okay so this is the optimistic view. We are running two updates, one to the local copy and one to the server in parallel, and we assume that everything is right. Okay. If we don't, uh, if we want, if we don't want to risk it, it's better to update the server, and later on reload the data. Okay. So for example we may have uh, uh, at least uh, updating the local data only after the post has finished that's a possibility okay so in this case we are still updating the local data from local data so we are updating list uh, list from element we are not reloading everything but at least we are adding the element only if the uh, the post went through didn't have any problem so in this case we are catching possible problems on the server that will prevent the addition we are not giving the illusion to the user that the, the element has been added when it, really in the server we had some problems so this solved this uh, but of course uh, first of all the application will be slower and second we are not uh, let's say uh, getting the chance of uh, loading new fresh data from the server if we need okay but this is another possibility if we know that we are the only user seeing matching this data it can be done but uh, the element will happen after a while so like uh, the example that we did well, that we did before before okay we are typing something it doesn't appear after a while okay it pops down but for the moment, for a moment, the user is unsure whether it, the system really caught this comment. In the first case, the, LM, the new element appears immediately. In the second case, it only appears after the post is done. So, um, what are more, let's say, complete solutions? Again, they are not really complete. There are better solutions, more. There, as we said before, there is no real, real solution that works uh, in every case. Um, again we need to rely on extra information that remembers the state of the of the operations so this is a possible uh, say more complicated way so it doesn't stay in three lines so it needs uh, full slides uh, let's start let's start to follow this code 
so we are starting from the uh, add item as always add item is here and needs to add an, uh, an item to the uh, to the to the list okay both on the client and on the server so what we are doing is uh, immediately we are adding uh, the element to the list of items and we are marking it as a temporary so we are adding okay now we have uh, a new score 27 but this is temporary Okay, this is just temporary, or we can show it in a different color, so we show it with, a, with an icon or whatever. So we are immediately adding something on the client with some visual indication that is a temporary element. And in parallel, we start the API for storing that into the server. When the API finishes so when we actually the server tells us that the poster was successful we can uh, update some flag some boolean value update saying okay now the update has been completed and uh, we have this effect that depends on this boolean value that will do a second fetch uh, this time in this time we are doing a get operation so when the post is finished we set a flag and this flag will trigger a get that will reload the data okay and do another set list with the new data this time it will be completely new copy of data that will overwrite everything we already have and so we'll also override this element and we'll overwrite uh, the temp, uh, let's say, flag by showing the real list of items that will, was uh, um, taken from the server. So in this case, we are doing, we are solving several, uh, several problems uh, um, at once. Okay, we are uh, showing immediately to the user that our action was uh, uh, received. So if I click on delete, then the element this um, disappears immediately. If I'm clicking on add, the element will be added immediately first. So I give an immediate feedback. Second, I tell the user that this feedback is temporary with some color, icon, or text, or whatever. So the user knows that it may change in a short time. No? It's still loading in a way. And third, uh, we take the opportunity to refresh the whole uh, set of uh, items and so after this second update uh, um, everything uh, will be updated to the to the real state from the server okay I have a fourth uh, uh, say advantage here is that uh, if any other callback uh, any other event tender or any other effect needs uh, to refresh the data understand that it needs to refresh the data they only just need to flip this flag if whenever i set update to uh, true the list is also the list is reloaded okay and so it's i have a, a, a very easy effect to trigger i set it through i know it reloads so setting it through may be uh, uh, say an action after an add after a delete after a post maybe we also have a timeout that runs periodically and we know that we set it through and then we refresh, refresh the list unless uh, uh, where's um, yes in the meantime we can also do some local modifications but every time we do some local modification we should plan to refresh the list uh, altogether um, Francesco is, happening, is asking, uh, we would insert if update into the get item call. Uh, you have, we have it here. If update is, is there. Okay. Uh, the effect will trigger uh, both when we are going from false to true and from true to false. Of course, only one of the two uh, flips uh, should be considered. 
okay so only when it becomes true because when it becomes false again the effect is called but we don't need to do anything more okay that's why we have this, this if, if update uh, to avoid running the the get twice when the update becomes false again okay uh, you can call it update you can call it uh, loading i i like to call it dirty okay i'm setting a flag that says that some, my data is dirty is no longer clean and so i need to refresh it like uh, you are we uh, we studied in the in the caches in the microprocessor we have the dirty bit that tells me okay this data you can use it but be aware this is not uh, the latest one okay it may have been modified anna uh, likes to complicate our lives okay but it's right uh, what happens if the update is not successful um, we should in any case refresh uh, the uh, the interface and if we are refreshing the interface while the update uh, wasn't successful the supposedly new data will not appear because the post was not successful so in this case we sh we need uh, and it's you're right okay but in one slide you can only fit so much we should need to also have a try catch here around this uh, uh, await method okay and if, if we catch uh, uh, an error in the in the fetch so the api was not okay or if not okay here uh, we just uh, have to set update through again so in in every case okay we set the we flip we, we flip the flag to true in every case whether the post was successful or not it, if it was successful i need to refresh the data because i want the new data to be displayed if it wasn't successful i need to uh, refresh the data uh, to roll back from the local modifications that they did uh, optimistically before okay so in both cases uh, if the post succeeded the new data will contain the new element if the first um, had some problems the new the, the new data will be the same copy of the old one and so i will remove the, the temporary one so it's always safe to go back home and restart uh, uh, from scratch maybe you want to do something more like uh, some error messages uh, uh, shown here in the case of a network error or in the case uh, of an application error so you remember if the response is not okay if you have a 500 code you go to the else here if you have a network problem a connection problem you go to the catch there but probably the, the solution will be the same okay but try to to keep the two flows separate one is ensuring that the data is sane and is valid it can always be solved by, by refreshing and the other is handling the actual error showing the message, uh, asking the user to reload, and this is some, some extra action that you need to do, which is more complex, of course, because it depends on the, on the single case. But uh, uh, reloading the data never hurts. Hmm? Uh, just remember, we already saw that get uh, is idempotent, means that you can call it many times, uh, and it always gives you the same result. You don't have any side effects by calling get once more. It's a bit of let's say, an extra load on the server, but uh, that's its job, basically. Hmm? Okay. Um, before going to a break and then going to the exercise, I just wanted to show you uh, a, a very few slides more, um, because there are some rules uh, in which we can, we are now uh, used to different hooks. Uh, we have the context, we have the state, we have the effect, uh, and we are using them normally. Okay. Um, uh, some bit of background information of how they work because if I'm looking at this code and the first time I looked uh, at this code uh, when I studied the hooks uh, it, it was really strange because we are inside the function we are calling another function okay and we get some object in return and oh, nothing bad but when I call this function a second time, my mind tells me that uh, this function call should return me a new object. Okay, like we are creating a local variable, and uh, uh, every time you enter a function, this variable is different, even if you are calling a function to initialize it. Okay, so how can a function 
remember from call to call some information, some values. Hmm? This is not the normal behavior of a function. Local variables are destroyed. We are not storing anything in the, pro in the function prototype or whatever. Okay. This is why the different hooks are playing some tricks with the function prototype themselves that we don't see it here. Basically, no, it's not a closure because we are not, uh, um, you see, when we close the function here, uh, this variable disappears and this variable disappears and so on. So there's no variable left alive that can remember what we did. The only variable left alive is the function itself the function object okay so what hooks are doing is adding some extra hidden variables to the function itself uh, uh, in uh, some space that they call uh, slots so when I call a use state basically the function example example whatever has a new slot that contains this object that is returned the first time a new slot is created and the object is returned and then we call a use state once more and it create a second slot and we call use state once more and get a third slot and so we get the references to these hidden objects that are linked to the function itself okay the second time we call the function instead of creating new slots uh, it finds that these uh, objects are, have already been created and they're already attached to the prototype of the function so it just returns these objects okay we can call it like sort of a static uh, uh, variables okay something that is persisted across uh, um, function calls because they are part of the function it's more complex than this because if we have a uh, a component which is called three times uh, is the same function but is different components so it's more complex i'm trying to make it simple here because we don't need to say to go deep into the implementation of the hooks but the only information that keeps uh, consistency between different calls of the function is the order this is the first slot this is the second one this is the third one that contains some opaque information that we may use inside our function and our function so basically we have we have, we, have, we have to be extra careful that every time we call this function all the hooks are called always in the same order this is the golden rule every time you call a function the hooks state effect whatever context should always be called in the same order so that in the second call in the third call you you link the old object with the new ones in the proper way okay it doesn't remember this hidden variable it doesn't know the name of the variable it knows that it's, uh, it's the first slot that was occupied by a hook this is the second slot that was occupied by a hook and so on and uh, so this order is the real uh, say uh, rule and it can be summarized uh, by these two practical rules first uh, you can call hooks uh, only at the top level of a function so inside a if and if inside a while or whatever you cannot call a, a hook function all the function that you start with use cannot be called from inside a conditional statement or a loop only outside only in the in the main body of the function so only in the top level braces of the function you may have hooks not inside any other control statements um, and uh, only call a hook from react functions from components not from uh, callbacks not from uh, uh, extra function that you define but always from the body of the function because it will need to attach a slot to the act to the actual component to the actual function uh, so you cannot put uh, you cannot have a, uh, say an extra function create my state and this extra function do, uh, does all the use states and that you it returns you the 
the, the, the full list of variables. No, this use state should be inside your component function because it's not a normal function that can be just put outside and uh, say, encapsulated into, a, an, into another function because it's playing trick uh, with the function implementation itself. Okay, so if we, if we follow these two rules, we are sure that the um, hooks are working correctly. Practically, the first few instructions of a function should always be the, the hooks calls. And then we have the code of the function itself. Uh, in order to avoid uh, even this, this, the use effect, uh, you may feel that sometimes I need this effect and sometimes I don't need. So I only define it if some other condition is not going to work. Okay, you define the effect and then the if you must should be put inside the effect itself. So it will trigger and maybe you don't do anything, but you cannot define a hook conditionally. Okay. So this is just a special case. We never did that by even by mistake, but at least we should know that we should really not do it. Otherwise, the, the you know uh, uh, we we cannot predict what will happen. If there are states and states, okay, the, we are using the uh, what previously was the count state will become mode and vice versa, and uh, of course the application will do strange things. Okay, this was just a warning, so uh, well, let's, let's know the rules uh, and let's understand why. Okay, um, so we have reasoned about some patterns and uh, uh, in the next hour uh, we are going to try to apply some of these patterns to our uh, React scores application uh, that uh, I, I loaded on GitHub uh, yesterday. And so uh, during the, if, if you didn't do it uh, yet, uh, maybe you, you you may want to clone the the, the week eleven uh, project on GitHub. Uh, I in the Git uh, in the week eleven project, I just put together the API server from last week, uh, no, two weeks ago, with all the APIs for the React Score server and the front end that doesn't have any API call yet. It's just the front end with the fake courses and fake uh, exams. And so we are trying to transform a, a fa um, an application working with fake data into a client server application by trying to um, implement these patterns uh, that we uh, studied together and try to avoid the mistakes so we can see in practice uh, how to implement this, uh, these rules. Okay, so if there are no uh, questions at the moment, uh, I would give you some break and we can start again at 10.30 if you like. <laughs>